Yeah, good morning, everyone. So even though you are just settling in, I think I should nevertheless start uh, with the lecture. Uh, the outline is given here. These are many points. <coughs> and I think I will at least cover the first three points of this list. This is a little summary of what we have seen yesterday. Uh, there were some questions from your side, or some, let's say, pointing out some misunderstandings or problems, and I may briefly comment on this using this diagram here of uh, Case Dullemont. You can see here the phase of an overview of the planet formation process, starting from micrometer-sized dust grains all the way to full-fledged planets here. And yesterday's idea was to cover here the first part, which is in this red box here. So we start from here to sort of kilometer-sized objects through a sequence of collisions. And one question of yours that was relating to this was, how long does this process take? Uh, this, I have to say, it's not known entirely. It depends on these growth enhancement processes that I mentioned to you yesterday. How, can, how well can you condense the dust in the disk to enhance the uh, uh, collision rates between the particles and to reduce the relative velocity to such values that you have an easy growth in those things? And one, a few possibilities that I mentioned also yesterday, I mean, uh, eddies in turbulent flows. I've briefly mentioned these MRI uh, simulations by Anders Johansson and others, where you could collect dust particles within the turbulent eddies sufficiently that it was possible to grow to a serious size body within a few dynamical timescales. In vortices, I didn't talk about this, but disks have non-axisymmetric features. Vortices are pressure maxima in the disk. And as I have mentioned, dust collects in pressure maxima, so dust tends to collect in these vortices if those exist. We may hear more, a, few, a little bit more about vortices in disks later on in the disk lectures here. So dust, dust may collect in vortices, which may enhance the growth, or in pressure bumps which are radially, radial variation in the pressure distribution in the disk. Usually the pressure is falling off with radius, but there may be a maximum at a certain radius given, to, let's say, um, caused by opacity transition at a certain location in the disk. So you may collect particles there as well, or by a transition from a dead zone in a disk to an active zone, as we will hear later on today. So the, the time scale, as I said, approximately, very roughly, 10 to the 5 years. There's some limitation on the time scale that this can take from the mentioned uh, chondritic information from the solar system here. It should not take more than about a million years or so. So it should be finished within the first million year of the solar system. So this was the first part. And now today, in, the, in this lecture, we want to continue the growth of particles and go to bigger objects here, which we then call gravity-assisted growth. And I will come in a moment to what this means, actually. Here in the first part, particles were just growing because they were coming close to each other. They cross-section, you, you, you hit each other because the, the mutual cross-section was large enough. And here you can, we will see that gravity can enhance the effective cross-section of the particles considerably, and this can lead to very rapid growth to bigger objects here. And then later on, we have gas capture onto these cores that are formed, and we can form the massive giants observed in our solar system and in exosolar systems. And there was one other remark, I think, to my talk that it might have been a little bit fast. I will try to reduce the speed, but whenever you have the feeling that it's going too fast again, you just ask an intermediate question and that will immediately slow me down, I think. So this is now your duty to do that. So let's go to the problem now. We have seen that uh, initially they grow by collisions here, and uh, the objects that are in a size 1 to 10 kilometers are called planetesimals, and they range from this size basically to moon-sized objects. 
And if they have reached the size of the moon, we call them sometimes also planetary embryos. That is a term that occurs frequently. These are the objects that uh, finally will lead to the uh, terrestrial planets or to the cores of the massive planets. So this is the starting point. These objects are the starting point for the next, this phase of the planet formation. Now gravitational interaction, which we could neglect for the very small particles, is important. And the aerodynamic drag acting on these forces is very small in this regime. So you can move the particles by inhomogeneities in the disks, for example. Yeah, so the disk may be turbulent, so the turbulence is some density enhanced, turbulent eddies are some density enhancements, and these density enhancements can pull gravitationally on the growing planet and move it also and steer the planet up a little bit. So this is what we call here tidal interaction between the planet and the disk. And so how do you model this? You have, if you start out from one kilometer sized objects, and want to grow them to a full-fledged planet, you need something like 10 to the 11 particles or even more. And this, of course, is a um, numerical endeavor which is very difficult to solve. Only very few people can do 10 to 11 particles, maybe cosmology or something, with very simple n-body methods there. So you have two different types of uh, approaches here. You have direct numerical methods or you have statistical methods to solve this. I will come back to that. Gravity. Gravity assist. How does it work? It works through a concept called gravitational focusing. So imagine here we have a growing protoplanet, a planetesimal here, and this from here there's a particle coming with a velocity v infinity, which I will call v relative in the following, comes here, approaches this particle, it's attracted gravitationally by this particle p here and deflected and if the distance, the smallest approach here, is smaller than the actual physical radius of this particle here, then it will fall onto the object and be accreted on the object. Okay? And then we can, if, if all the particles which approach from infinity here are within this area sigma here, and all particles within this area sigma would actually reach this growing planet, then we would call this sigma here the effective cross-section for this collision. So how can we analyze this? How can we calculate this effective cross-section sigma, which is an enhanced cross-section over the purely geometric cross-section? You see, if you have two particles approaching each other, they can only hit if they come very close, closer than the sum of the two radii. Okay. So we have here, we can take two conservation laws, angular momentum conservation, which just relates this distance R0 here, the radius of sigma, with the relative velocity, and this is equal to the angular momentum here, just Rp times the velocity here. This is the first conservation law. The second conservation law is energy conservation. The kinetic energy here is given by the kinetic energy here, plus the potential here, and the potential here is just zero because they're infinitely, uh, uh, they're uh, very far apart. So you can see we have two conservation laws here, and now we can calculate here the impact parameter uh, R0, basically we want to calculate, we take this and this formula, we combine it into one formula, and we obtain for sigma this equation here. Okay? So sigma is basically the area of, the, uh, of this incoming objects that will hit the growing planet. Okay? And then we can write this as the radius of this object here, the geometric radius of the growing object, times this enhancement factor F graph, which is given by this expression here. So F graph is basically the enhancement above the purely geometric uh, uh, cross-section here that you have. And then you can, in, the, in this we have introduced the escape velocity of the object, given by this expression here, Basically, it's, it's factor two times the Keplerian velocity at the surface. So this is um, factor square root of two times the Keplerian velocity here. So this is a standard relation here. 
and then we can see in a cold disk of planetesimals, then when the relative velocity is very small, um, in this cape with, uh, in, uh, with relative to the escape velocity, the, cr the cross section can be very much enhanced over the geometric cross section. Okay. Some people define this, this is just terminology, Safronov number, you may have seen this, or you will see this sometimes, it's just this ratio here, basically. And if you have two bodies with different sizes here, if this one is his also finite size, you just replace RP with the sum of the two radii, and then you have also the, the general case. Here we have assumed that this incoming body is very small in comparison to the size of this body here. So we can see if gravity operates, we can enhance the geometric cross-section considerably, and this will lead, or can lead, under, under good circumstances, to a runaway growth of the objects. And this is very important uh, in the following. Another concept which is very important is the so-called Hill sphere. The Hill sphere uh, is a concept that came out of the restricted three-body problem. You have two bodies basically here. Here's the sun depicted, a major body, and here is the growing planet, for example. This is the Earth, I think, here. Earth and sun, and then you look at the, the motion of an additional particle which is massless in the gravitational field of the two uh, gravitating bodies here. So they orbit each other, but if you go into the co-rotating frame and look at the equipotential lines in the co-rotating frame, you may know you have these very well-known Lagrange points here, basically L1 and L2, which are important here, and then here the uh, L4 and L5. And the radius, basically, which is covered between L1 and L2, is called the Hill sphere, or in other contexts also sometimes the Roche lobe. Okay. And the formula for this, for this Hill sphere, basically, is this relation here, so it's proportional to the mass of this small object MP here, uh, divided by the stellar mass, one-third to power one-third, so there's twice one-third here, which is very nice to remember, and then you have the distance of the planet from the um, uh, sun here, the image, the image axis. So this is a hill, so-called hill sphere or hill radius, which is a concept that comes up uh, again and again. Then three-body effects. I've mentioned that the gravitational focusing is a sort of three-body effect because you have the star, you have the growing planet, and you have the little particle which tries to hit the growing planet. So you have three bodies involved here. Okay. And if you look then in the do n-body integrations, basically, of these objects here in the vicinity of the growing object, so the point in the center here is the growing planet. The sun is somewhere here on the left. So the growing object, and the, if you look at the orbits here, they become very complicated in the vicinity of, of this object. I mean, it's like the near-Earth asteroids. You see, if a near-Earth asteroid comes into the vicinity of the Earth, the, com the motions in the vicinity of the Earth is very uh, difficult to calculate. That's why it's so hard to predict also the outcome, whether this asteroid will actually hit the Earth or not. That's why here in the media, oh yes, the, this might be hitting the Earth with a probability of 10 to minus 6 or so. Yeah? And the next day you read, oh, we have revised the probability to 1 times 10 to minus 4. Yeah? So this is because the motion is essentially chaotic. You have a three-body problem, it's a chaotic motion. It's very hard to predict. Okay? And this change of the orbits in the vicinity of this growing uh, object leads to a change in the effective cross-section, to a change in this enhancement factor F graph. Okay, and this is depicted here. This is a consequence of these numerical simulations here. Here is this factor F graph plotted. I don't know, is this possible to read this in the back here? These little things? Okay, this is F graph versus V escape over V rel relative. This is plotted here. And the dashed line it's exactly equation three, which is this equation here. So this is effectively the outcome of this, okay? This is the dashed line. So initially for very small relative velocity, it fits excellently, but if we then here come into this regime here, we have a cutoff at something like 10 to the four due to this three body pro, uh, uh, um, motions here. So we can see we can increase the effective cross section, geometric cross section by a factor to a maximum of 10 to the four which is a lot, okay? But typical values will be smaller, so this is the optimum value here for very large escape, uh, uh, let's say, uh, or very small relative speeds 
with respect to the growing object. Okay, so for very cold and thin disks, basically. Okay. Good. So we can look at the growth modes that you can get. And again, you have different types of growth modes here, which occur, in fact, in this uh, uh, growth to terrestrial planets, both phases we have. We start from an, uh, a situation where we have lots of many small particles created by the very first step mentioned yesterday. So we can grow them in a fashion where you have equal sized bodies all over the place, or you can grow them where a big object grows much faster than the other small objects, which we call runaway growth. Okay? So the big object secretes all these fast bodies here and grows faster and faster in comparison to the small ones. And here they grow in an equal pace, pace in which we call also sometimes oligarchic growth here. It's like a system of many equal-sized planets, and they're all these oligarchs. They reign the regions nearby. And how can you measure this, whether uh, a growth phase is, is runaway or not runaway, or oligarchic? You look at the change, the time change, <coughs> sorry, the time change of the mass ratio of two particles. And here we assume initially M1 is larger than M2. And then we look at this rate of change here, we can just differentiate it out, and we have this expression, it's very simple. And then it's clear, we see here, this is a factor which is always uh, positive, basically, and greater than one here. We can see here uh, the relative growth rates of the individual masses here. And we see we have runaway growth, basically, if this here is larger than one, we have runaway growth. And if this is smaller than one, we have orderly growth here. Okay? So and they are given by the relative growth rates of the masses here. Okay? That's what it is. This quantity here, 1 over m, dm over dt, is the quantity that is important and measure the type of growth we are in. Okay? As I said, if relative growth increases with m, runaway decreases with m, auto growth. And now we will see in the simulations what type of growth phases we have. We are a little bit more complicated. You may concentrate here on the red formula here only. The other one is just to back up. If you want to have more information, you can just read what is in between here. Okay? Now we have them. How do we calculate the mass growth? We take the mass growth, the time change of the mass of the particle is basically the, the cross-section, which is now geometric and gravitational cross-section, times the density of the incoming particles, times the relative velocity of the growing particle and this incoming flux of particles. Okay, this is the standard relation, how you calculate also momentum transfer and everything to an object here. And then we can plug in for sigma what we have found before. Yes, we have plug in the geometric cross-section times the gravitational enhancement factor here. Okay? So this is the equation for the mass growth of the particle. So if we assume some reasonable approximation and plug in the numbers that, that uh, uh, Phil has yes, mentioned yesterday, we can come up, come up to this equation here where we replace basically the three-dimensional density of the particles by a surface density here. We plug in for relative velocity, we plug in the Keplerian velocity basically times um, uh, the eccentricity here, and we come to this equation. Okay, so we can see the growth is proportional to the density of particles. Of course, this is to be expected. The growth is proportional to omega Kepler, which is something uh, is basically proportional to the dynamical time scale, we would say here. Okay, that means it's slower at larger distances. Omega Kepler is the Keplerian rotation velocity. It drops off as r over minus three halves. So it's in the outer part of the disk much lower than in the inner parts of the disk. That means in the outer parts of the disk, this growth time is longer, much longer than in the inner parts of the disk. Okay. And the relative velocity between the two objects enters only in this focusing factor, which is this last bit here. Okay. <coughs> Good. So we have this equation here for the growth, starting out from this when we go to this equation here. Okay. So, what if we take now, just to illustrate these two uh, growth regimes, and by the way, you can read this very nicely, what I just said in the last few minutes in the book by Phil. Yes, Phil, this is a little advertisement section now. Yeah? Uh, there's something I took over from his book here, some of the concepts here, to make it simple. 
And okay, so we can either have two cases here. We take first this f graph, the focusing factor to be constant. Yeah, that means in this equation here, this is a constant here. The growth is proportional to this here. Okay. And then we can see that if we have the particle we name now m here for short, we have the relative growth rate here is proportional to the m to the minus one third, which is small, and this implies a linear growth with radius. Okay. So then the radius is proportional to t. Okay, to the time t. Now we take the relative velocity constant, whether this is achieved or not, let's, uh, we can discuss this at some point maybe. Then we have the relative velocity here is proportional to our p, proportional to the m to the one third. So this is positive here, the exponent. Here was the exponent was negative, exponent is positive here. And this implies formally, if you plug it into the equation, you can integrate this equation here, the last one, which would uh, mean that m grows to infinity in a fin finite time. Okay, that means you, you create ar arbitrary large objects in, in, in a finite time. Okay, but it's clear if, if, if an object grows in a disk, let's say you have one big object here and lots of small particles here, it's very clear that through gravitational interaction of the massive growing object with the small planetesimals that are still around, you will steer the planetesimals up and you will change the simple picture here. Okay. And then you, you change the situation here, so you have some modifications here. It's clear that this can't go on here. When you have bigger objects there, this can't go on. This is like uh, the, this change in the uh, enhancement factor you have for larger and larger objects here. And now we look at the results of numerical simulations, that whether we can find these type of growth regimes in numerical simulations or not. <coughs> so this comes to section 2.2. We want to grow now from uh, to uh, uh, our little planetesimals to protoplanets. Okay. Th there are two basic methods here. There's the direct method, which is this one. And then you just start out with your initial objects, initial planetesimals, and planetesimals. You look at the motion of those, the the and this is given by the acceleration from the central object, the sun, and the sum of the accelerations from the other embryo or other planetesimals that are growing, which is the second term. You sum over all other planetesimals here. Then you have gas drag, as before. Then you have some changes of this velocity through collisional processes, which you can or need to parameterize, of course. Yes. Yeah, because you can only simulate a limited number of planetesimals, which is still much smaller than the actual number of planetesimals. So you have to take into account that during your simulations, there are many collisions with other particles, which you do not model directly, but you have to model somewhat statistically. And this goes into this uh, uh, collision factor F here. Okay. Good. And the advantage of this is, this is an accurate method because you have a direct n-body integrator. There are, of course, some influences here which are not really so predictable a priori here. And the disadvantage is, in principle, you need 10 to the 11 particles here to model everything here. So you need to reduce it, model much fewer particles, and see what happens then. The other option is, a stat the other possibility is a stat statistical one. And what uh, people do there is they solve for the probability function f, which is a function of the radius and the velocity of the particles, such that the number density of the particles is given by this integral over the velocities here. Okay? This is basically the probability that you find a particle at position r plus dr formally with a velocity v plus dv formally. Okay, and you can substitute, in principle, you can write this as a function also of, of the eccentricity or the inclination of, of the objects here. Okay, so, and then you solve a Boltzmann type of equation for this probability function here, which is given by uh, this form. The left-hand side is just the total time derivative of f. df over dt is the left-hand side here. And this is given by the uh, collisions between the particles here and then the change of this f given by gravity, uh, gravitational forces here. Okay, these are the two contributions here. And then in addition, you add here 
a sort of correlation equation just like you have in the initial phase of, of, of this growth here. You have if particles collide, you change the number here of particles with a given size here and k, let's say you change it when you have a positive collision here and then you change minus uh, uh, the change when you move from one bin to another bin here. So this is the standard correlation equation. You have a growth part on one side and you have a, a part where you move from one bin to the other one through, let's say, a fragmentation process and so on. Okay? The advantage here, you can model the total ensemble, you can model all planetesimals at the same time. Of course, the payoff is you have only a statistical approach, okay? not a direct solution here. Yeah? But this is one possibility that has been uh, done also frequently uh, already many, many years ago, by the way. Okay? So now, now we look at the outcome of these type of simulations here. <coughs> Here's an example of an n-body simulation. And typically what you do, I, I listed it here rather, rather comprehensively here. So you take a certain width in radius around 1 AU typically. Here you have from 0.99 to 1.1 AU. You put in many particles here, 300, 3000 bodies here with a mass of 10 to the 23 grams, which is of the order of serious mass, okay? Roughly. Cirrus has something 10 to the 24, I think, or so. And um, with a mean density here, and then you, this is the first part here, and then you just uh, calculate the subsequent evolution here. So you have initial eccentricity distribution here. You calculate the evolution of these particles here by direct and body method here. And we can see here you have growth of one big particle here and lots of small particles here. So this phase is clearly, as you can see, it's a runaway phase. So the early evolution of a small number of planetesimals here, uh, of serious size here, is grows then if they can form in the initial phase, they grow by a runaway process to much bigger objects here. Okay? And this is the time scale for this. As you can see it's around 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 years this process takes. Okay? We'll just go on a little bit here. And then we have, yeah, this one I will drop. The red tells you this uh, slide to drop. So, and then we have gravitational steering. We have seen this here, that the eccentricity is starting initially from something 0.05 here, and then it increases here. This is called gravitational steering because the big object attracts the small objects gravitationally and excites the eccentricity and inclinations of these small objects. So if you look in time, you know, the evolution, uh, this is the time evolution now here in years, you can see 10,000 and it goes on. And this is the mean eccentricity here, the solid line, the dashed line is the mean inclination here of the of small particles that you can see they grow in time because of the runaway growth of the big object that changes the uh, distribution for the small objects. So this is called gravitational steering. And this means that you increase the relative velocities between the particles because a particle in eccentric orbit means if you compare this with the big object here that the relative velocity is typically enhanced above the typical velocity of a circular particle at the same time. Okay, and in equilibrium, you can see this equipartition of energy leads to a certain relation between eccentricity and inclination. The eccentricity is basically four times the inclination here. Okay, so this comes out very nicely also, the theoretical expectation here with the results of the simulation. And this was done by H. Rokov Kubo already uh, uh, several years ago. The other, uh, the other uh, approach here is the statistical approach. And there you have this distribution function, as I told you, and this is already from the 90s here and earlier. People have done this, Weatherill and Stewart here. Here you can see the distribution of these particle sizes here, number of bodies with a given size. Uh, at certain years, here you can see you still have this fall off here. Uh, the, from the initial distribution, uh, which is given here by A. I think A, you had <coughs> one size here of this mass here, roughly, serious type of mass here, or smaller even. And then you grow here, and then you create one big object, basically, in the end. This is also depicted here later on, and this is after 500,000 years, typical time scale again. So it's comparable to the time scale you found in the n-body simulations. 
or the n-body simulations later found for the simulations. And this is depicted here also. You have here the distribution here. This is uh, the evolution here in, um, in radius, and this is the in, in mass here. You see you have a few sticking out objects here for very large mass, 10 to the 26, 27 grams here. There are a few very large objects here yeah, at the end. And um, so yeah, this is the outcome of the statistical simulation. So it's very similar uh, to the uh, outcome of the numerical simulations. Okay, and I think this is a good point to stop here. So we found in both approaches that a few massive embryos with e equal mass and sort of constant separations form. And now I can have this little break. that 
you can accrete objects which come closer, typically closer than the distance. This is a measure, let's see, from what region you accrete objects. And the radial extent of this region is proportional to the distance. This is in this ideal country, and you will see again the distance. The region, the, the, the region and radius of the this that you can agree with, mm -hmm. is the right. radial extent of the hill sphere. So uh, there's also the Bondi radius. Uh, yeah, the Bondi radius is, is something which comes from spherical accretion. Yes, that's right. Yes. But in this case, uh, yeah, you need angular momentum. Uh, in in there this is case, a, the, Bondi, momentum the Bondi radius is, is a radius that is, that is given by the um, sound speed. Basically. That's right, yeah. So it's this is only the mass speed. ratio here uh -huh. and the distance. And the Bondi radius, because it's it's a hydrodynamic, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, result basically, mm -hmm. includes the sound speed. Okay. So all has all which has to do with hydrodynamics has the sound speed. In that's it. right. Yeah. So that's the difference. This is pure n body. Okay. So it has only okay. the the masses and the distances. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Question: Do you want to ask them now if they have questions? Maybe. Uh, from the discussion that's come out? Yeah, can do I that. I don't know, yeah. there might be a different yeah, yeah. way. Some people had mentioned yeah, yeah, okay. at the end, but... Like we did yesterday. Or even I can ask them if they like that. But here, you can accomplish so much. So we, we need to continue. <coughs> now you have discussed a few things here. And uh, the students in the first row here, which is, there's still many places here, t can take advantage of talking directly to me and ask questions to me, of course, which was the case here. And now, uh, do you have questions for me as well from the background also? Do you have any additional questions after your discussion here with your neighbors? Are you a student there in the back? <laughs> okay, yeah, Mike. So, so the, the, if I understand it correctly, the question is how the growth times depend on the distance from the sun. Yes, I mean, quite naturally, people want to make here the terrestrial planets, so they look at 1 AU. Oops, sir. But if you looked at the math ma equation for the mass growth I've shown, that contained this factor omega, which means that the time scales increase if you go out. Uh, basically, changing, there are two things that change the time scale, obviously. Uh, I'm going to have to go back very far here. Two things that change the time scale. Let's assume this ratio is given, this radius is given. So these two factors can change the, the, the time scale here. If you go out, the density of particle changes, the surface density of the solid changes. And there we need to come back to the concept of the ice line, which I haven't really mentioned yet and nobody else yet, but it will come up. Yeah, so when you go beyond the so-called ice line, where uh, the temperature is so cold that ice can condense, the number density of solid particles that can grow potentially further increases very rapidly. So this can shorten the time scale again, and, but otherwise the density drops with radius, omega drops with radius, so the time scales become longer with some power of r, with something like r to the minus 2 or something, roughly. Okay. So if here you have, at one AU, you have a million, uh, 1,000 years, and then you can calculate how much you have at five AU, okay? <laughs> Good, shall I take more questions or shall I continue with the lecture then? <laughs> can directly start the question section. But, any, but I think I should continue a little bit here so we can then ask coherent questions later on. Okay, so we have seen here <coughs> that um, these numerical simulations lead to the formation of somewhat equal-sized objects here with a constant separation here, okay? Now we can see what is the end of this growth. If we look at this conceptually here, so the large objects have typically circular orbits, but they have a limited reservoir of partners they, they can collide with, okay? And this leads to the concept of the isolation mass. So collisions can only occur if the objects come close to each other. And if we assume that typically that they accrete from a region which has the size of the hill sphere in radius, yeah, so we can see they accrete mass from an annulus here, which is given by the size 
of the Hill sphere. So one Hill sphere out and one Hill sphere in, let's say, yes, you create from that region onto this object, then you can, and then this, you can see this is directly proportional to the Hill sphere, then you can calculate the final mass this object will attain given by this relation, okay? You just write M equals is the so-called isolation mass. So we have this nonlinear algebraic equation here, and more detailed simulations lead factors slightly different from one here. Okay, so this is given by the surface density there, the the uh, uh, actual uh, semi-major axis here, and this mass ratio again, and the semi-major axis. And we can calculate this. For at one AU, we find the isolation mass is something like 500th of the Earth mass, okay? So this is the mass of these equal-sized objects, the typical mass that form after this stage, okay? About 40 protoplanets have formed with that typical mass here, and a typical mean distance here given by a few hill radii, typically something at 10 hill radii. They are separated, okay? This gives this number here. And then you can do the same thing for Jupiter. You find these numbers here, <clears throat> they can grow, the isolation mass is a few times the mass of the Earth, which is very useful if you look later on today, I think, already at the growth of massive planets. Okay. So this is the end of the growth. You have equal mass-sized objects with the mass of this isolation mass here, uh, equally si sized and equally spaced in distance here, and this isolation mass depends on radius. Okay. Now we can come to the terrestrial planets. Okay, how do we grow them? So here, you take as an input now the outcome of the previous simulations, and you do n-body simulations. You see, the end of the previous work is usually sort of the lifetime of the inner disk, and the disk, people assume now, is now nearly gone in the inner parts, and then you can do pure n-body simulations of these leftovers equal massed object, okay? And you have a few particles, typically 100 here, but the problem is now you do direct simulations over a very long time scale. Not only a million years or so on, you do it 100 million years. And this gives already the time scale now for the formation of the inner solar system. It's about 100 million years, okay? It took 10 to 100 million years. It took, for example, to fully assemble the terrestrial planets in the solar system. And we can see here a simulation here. I will not go, the details are all spelled out here. From John Chambers, 1999. And in those days, the simulations were a little bit rough, as you can see now. Okay, so we start out here. Oops, sir. Is this not my computer, I think? Okay, so the mass of the, uh, in Earth masses here of the objects, so we have equal mass, equal mass uh, objects here initially spread out in a certain range, 0.5 to 2 AU here, and then they, you evolve this with an n-body integrator, and whenever they collide, they stick to each other, okay, mysteriously, 100% sticking, okay? This is another issue which one could clarify, of course. And then you, with the time given here, I don't know whether you can read this, 40 million years, 100 million years, and then you form Earth, Venus, surprisingly, Mercury and Mars, yeah? very straightforward. So we, could, we are done, basically. Yeah? So after this simulation, we could go home and say, fine, solar system is done, yes? Chambers, 1999, okay? So, but the story continues, of course, as you can imagine. Good, so that was this one. Yeah, this is the outcome of these type of simulations here. So you can form, most easily, systems similar to the solar system. Okay, as I have shown you, mostly three to four terrestrial planets, formation about 10 to the eight years here, but there are some differences in the, uh, in the details here. There's discrepancies with respect to the real solar system in the details here. Often we have no high mass concentration as in Venus and Earth, you see here. These are two different versions, new, paper one old, paper two new, where they improved a little bit here. Here you see the planets, Earth, Venus, and so on, and there's lots of junk, I wanted to say, left over still, okay? So there's not a clear separation. You know, they don't, Earth and Venus do not stick out, basically. And they, they have comparable mass, one Earth mass here, but this depends on the mass you put in, of course, so then you get the right mass out, very clearly. Then you have planets have very high eccentricity, which is plotted down here. This is the mass, the eccentricity here. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2, very high, too high. 
comparison to the uh, solar system here. And the spin orientations, I will not go into uh, at this point here. It's clear through these collisions, they come from all sides. You, in principle, can have arbitrarily rotation a, sp a, direct a direction of the spin of these objects here. And in the inner solar system, primarily the spins are all aligned. Uh, only Venus has a little bit difference. Okay. Yes? Uh, yes, the first point is that you have, in, in, the, in the present uh, solar system, you have Venus and, and Earth sticking out as the only objects with a very high mass. Yes, and here you have lots of objects with similar masses here also around, yes. And so you don't have objects which really stick out. Yeah, you need them and then all the other parts need to be gone, and so you have different objects here still. I quite, quite don't know, I have to admit, on what the small uh, 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 squares mean here in comparison to the large, small diamonds mean in the comparison to the large diamonds here. I think this is different runs here statistically and then averaged over these runs. Yes, they're different runs have with slightly different parameters they have done and they looked at all the variations here and these I think are the mean masses, the big, opt the big points are the mean masses if you average statistically over all these runs. Yeah, that's the whole point. So you have a whole distribution of masses here. Yeah, that's, I think, is the problem there, if I understand it correctly. Okay. So we have some new simulations then later on. And the, the difference, basically, to the other ones is you have more objects to start with. The computers got a little bit faster. You can take more objects and you can integrate them longer, basically. But the conceptually, these simulations are very similar, actually. And now it can take also, uh, if you want, you can take uh, residual gas disk left over or residual small uh, planetesimal still there, which creates some damping there. So this is also included here. And additionally, Sean Raymond and others here uh, looked at the water fraction of, of these planets here. So you start out, let's say, with a situation like this, with a, it's depicted here. Here's the eccentricity shown, and versus radius here, you have a semi major axis from 0.5 to 4. You spread it out with, e with equal mass, small particles here, and then they have different um, types of uh, um, contributions here. You have solid material here, but, or, or the colors mean the um, mass, the, the mass fraction of water in this object. Grayish or, or uh, dark here is no water, little water, more water, even more water. So blue is water, and then if you go here to the left, you have no water there. This is because the ice line in the solar system is something here between 2 and 3 AU at 2.7 AU. So outside you have lots of water, ice is condensed into the particles here, inside you have no water because what water was evaporated and couldn't collect directly on these dust particles here. And then you do long-term evolution here, and the idea is in all of these evolutions here, also here in chambers already, there is, which is very important, Jupiter and Saturn were already present. You see, because this, the, the time scale of formation of the inner solar system is long, and it's longer, much longer, than the formation time scale of Jupiter. So Jupiter was already present there, unbelievable or not, believe it or not, I mean, uh, when these inner uh, uh, planets formed, okay? So, we, and we can see here some nice simulations by uh, Sean Raymond. This is now with Jupiter stationary. Okay, so we have here again uh, the um, eccentricity here. And this is the same major axis. The colors mean the, the water content again. Jupiter is here at 5 AU, where it's now. And this is already a little bit in after 0.7 million years. Okay, now we just continue this simulation here. And the size of these objects is clear. The size is proportional somewhat to the mass of the object. So we see we form here the inner parts here. We form more rapidly these objects because in the inner parts, the number of collisions is higher. Yeah, so it may look they are the same number of particles, but the, the area or the, the, the volume is much smaller. That's why you collide much more often, of course. So that's why the growth rates in the inner parts of the disk of, the, of this in the solar system are, are enhanced and, and, and you grow faster. And as you can see, the same as before, you form very nicely terrestrial planets here, 80 million years, yes. And I think this will 
suddenly stopped on Vari, I think in 200 million years or so. You can see Earth, Venus, Mars, and no, there are a few asteroids left over here, and that's it. You see it? So you form a system roughly, again, roughly similar to what you have here. More interesting is, which is just for fun now, migrating Jupiter. Okay? Jupiter in the solar system had, may have migrated. We come to this later on. So Jupiter is now starting at 5 AU, something, and moves inward. Okay? So, and I just leave it here as a nice <coughs> example of what happens. So particles are captured in resonances here, scattered out, and moves in. Jupiter is excited here through gravitational interaction between these particles here. Okay, not quite the solar system, yeah? but anyhow, nice. Yeah? And this, as you can imagine already, this may relate to some extrasolar planetary systems, okay? Yeah? Oops, I can see it now. Because you have the planets here, you see, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 AU, and this is roughly, as we shall see later on, the region where you have these systems of super-Earths sitting there. And one option could be that they formed through a process where you have a massive planet moving in, squeezing together all these planetesimals here. Yeah, then the question, of course, is how, d why does it migrate here and other things? There are many questions to ask, yes, and so on. Nevertheless, you produce a system here of sort of massive planets here close to the star. Okay? So this is Sean Raymond, and, and he has all these movies uh, on a web page. You can just go there and, and try to find them. And there's more details that I could mention here. And if I mention something wrongly, I can already now divert you to his uh, web pages and they can correct all this. Okay. Improvements. <coughs> so we can still see there are some problems here. The problems are, did I mention them? The problems are high eccentricity of these planets here, as you can see here. Point, point 0.1 for the Earth, Mars point 0.1 is okay, M Venus also much higher, so Venus and Earth has, have basically zero eccentricity. Yes, point 0.01, so it's very small, yes, and only Mars, has, Mars and Mercury have a significant eccentricity in the inner solar system here, but they are smaller, and sm for smaller objects can be more easily excited. And the other problem which is visible already here, <coughs> in many of these simulations here, Mars is too big. Okay, Mars has typically the same size as the Earth. This may, you may say, well, I mean, you vary the initial conditions a little bit and, and play around with the parameters and then you can get rid of Mars and it's no problem there. But if you look at many of these simulations here, you find consistently that Mars is an object that turns out to be too big in these simulations here. Okay, and we'll come back later to this. Okay, to the second point, I will come back later in a few days possibly. And to the high eccentricity, I come back now. Okay, so two high eccentricities, that means you need so to damp the eccentricities, you need a damping agent. A damping agent is like honey, you see, if you th throw something into honey, pff, it will stop immediately. So, and here the damping agent is the other, the other sea of leftover planetesimals you might still have there. If the, 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 the planets, protoplanets, uh, or the full-grown terrestrial planets interact with this sea of planetesimals which is still left over, you, they, this can damp the eccentricity here, okay? So, and, and then you need this to damp the eccentricity, but then the, the, the drawback is, if you damp the eccentricities of these planets, you have fewer collisions then as well. You see, you need some eccentricity to excite collisions between these objects. If you have two high damping, they're all in the midplane, they all orbit on circular orbits, and they will not meet each other. So you have, this is a conflict here. You need damping to make the, eccentricity, the final eccentricity small, but at the same time, you need sufficiently high eccentricities to, to continue growth. Okay? And some solution, I will not go into this in detail. You can look it up here, dynamical shake-up model by these guys here. The idea is that you have, let's say, uh, uh, an excitation through resonances, to, through secular resonances with the outer planets which are already there, and they can increase the eccentricity at a certain time only. Then you enhance the growth, the planets or the, the secular, the resonances move in, and then you can successively get to planet formation induced by these secular effects here. And for more details, uh, I refer you to these people here. And I think this is a good place to stop here. Okay, thank you.
On the, yes, a few more words on the isolation mass. Yes, the isolation mass. The point is, you want to calculate the mass growth of particles which grow from a sea of equal size particles, okay? If you envision now you have a particle which is already a little bit bigger and it can only attract particles from its neighborhood, okay? So when it has emptied its neighborhood, then it cannot grow anymore, you see? And then you have a neighboring particle. You see, you have two big particles here and in between lots of small particles. So the big particles cannot grow infin infinitely because then the, the reservoir uh, diminishes. And this is basically a sign of this diminishing reservoir. And so the typically, one finds if we think that the mass comes from a few hill radii only, so from the vicinity, I've introduced the concept of this hill radius. This is the gravitational sphere of influence, basically. So if the particles are closer than that, they can be accreted. And this gives rise to a maximum mass you can get. And this is the isolation mass. Is that a little bit clearer? Yes. Okay, so the question relates here to the mass of the Earth. The simulations by Sean Raymond indicate that the Earth that is formed here has lots of water here. Very good point. I didn't discuss the, the problem of water here, but it comes up here again. So, I mean, these simulations here indicate that you can, in fact, accrete material from this region where you were quite watery already. And added to the inner planetary. But the question is, does this water that you could potentially accrete remain in, in the, on the Earth or not? Some people believe that you have many of these collisions and the collisions will heat up the Earth and the water might evaporate. So the question is really how much of this initial water that could potentially be delivered onto proto-Earth actually stays on proto-Earth. So some people actually assume that the Earth is formed wet by this scenario, for example. And other people say, I cannot really judge the validity of all these, 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 these arguments here. Other people say, well, this water, even though it might come from some region outside of the Earth, it's nevertheless evaporated because of the, uh, the very hot initial Earth. And that's why you might have, at time zero, let's say, wet Earth or dry Earth. And if you have the dry Earth, then you need to come back to the processes that Leonardo mentioned already, uh, which is typically assumed, then you need to accrete the water later on from, let's say, asteroids, comets, and so on. But there's one interesting finding also, which is now, uh, um, let's say, I think in, in, uh, in November last year, that the composition of water, D over H ratio, is identical uh, for in meteorites coming from Vesta and on the Earth. So this could, it would imply also that at the formation time of Vesta and Earth, they had similar times that you can, might have a process like this already. So you transfer to mix the water in these early phases. <coughs> So, so the question is uh, the too big mass in these simulations here and what one might change to make mass smaller and so on. Yeah? Is that basically the question, if I understood well, correctly? What? Yes. Yes, one can form, yes, that's true. And people play around with these initial conditions here. This is one simulation here. And now we can introduce the following. You can make variations in the mass of these particles. You can have a little bit bigger mass particles and smaller mass particles. You can have a radial distribution of particles you can play around with. You can have more particles in the inner part and fewer particles in the outer part. But I, as far as I have understood the result is that typically, statistically, the outcome is that mass turns out to be too large 
no matter what you vary here. Okay? And this is a problem which people have noticed, and one solution to this problem is this Nice scenario, the formation of the solar system. I will come back to this in a later lecture. So I, I would have to leave the answer to the full answer to your question to lecture eight, I think that is. Okay, we'll come back to that. <coughs> 